Jensen and the Lady of the Manor, Part 2, read by Jules Sanderson. Mrs Sinclair, I said, balancing on the chair, is this really necessary? Hold still, she replied, and taking a pin from between her teeth, pinned the hem of the long dress she had insisted I put on. Just because I'm the same height and general size as you, it doesn't make me a great tailor's dummy. You have curves in places I don't, and, I struggle to find the right words, places in places I don't. Oh, be quiet, she said. Mrs. Sinclair stepped back and looked up at me. She folded her arms over a healthily full chest and smiled to herself with satisfaction. Oh, yes, she said. I can see this is going to work out just fine. I presented myself at 2 p.m. as instructed. In coming up to the big house, I was fulfilling a commitment I had made the previous day, when Mrs. Sinclair had found me in the process of robbing the house. My career as an insurance agent, having been curtailed unexpectedly, a casualty of the economic fallout of the coronavirus pandemic, I had resorted to a slight career change, expanding my skills towards burglary. I was in the process of learning some of the occupational hazards of a life of crime. Having been discovered by Mrs. Sinclair, I had agreed to come up to her to discuss my punishment. Yes, I suppose it does sound rather strange, but the dear woman had me over a barrel, as it were. She claimed I'd invaded her privacy, which, truth be told, I probably did. I had discovered a rather intimate document on her desk entitled The Ten Tasks Required for the Feminization of Your Partner. The contents of this document, unseemly as they are, can be found in a link in the description below. When I'd arrived at the front door of the big house, Mrs. Sinclair had hurried me through to the parlour, instructed me to get into an evening dress and started pinning fabric into place. This was hardly what I'd expected. Do you often ask people to dress up, Mrs. Sinclair? I said. You happen to be the right size. I've been working on this dress for weeks. I want to wear it next weekend. It's my niece's wedding. Now step down from there and get changed. We'll have tea in the living room. As to the matter of your punishment, said Mrs. Sinclair as she poured the tea, looking quite matter-of-fact, I've given it serious thought. But is it really necessary, I persisted. Yes, I think we've covered that quite thoroughly. Aside from the matter of theft, breaking and entering, trespass, and other crimes I'm not really aware of, there's the issue of the invasion of my privacy. I've not forgotten that, she shifted uneasily, as I have no doubt you've not forgotten it. And very well, I said, wondering where this might lead. You're going to do me a service. Your punishment will take two parts. The first is simple enough. You're going to steal a painting. You can't be serious. Oh, I'm quite serious, she said. Although steal is a rather awkward word. In this case, it doesn't really convey the true nature of the problem. Think of it as more like repossessing. Can you elaborate a little, please? If I'm to undertake a crime on your behalf, I should know as much about it as possible. Mrs. Sinclair then began a long explanation, which in its condensed form went something like this. Her stepson, a general reprobate who had mercifully fallen out with his father and was largely absent from their lives, had, in order to support an expensive cocaine habit, not long ago removed a painting from the house. He had proceeded to sell it on eBay for several thousand dollars. This act of youthful idiocy was compounded in its seriousness by the fact that its insured value could not be recovered without filing a police report. Mr. Sinclair didn't wish to add to his son's troubles by reporting the matter to the police, who would quickly arrest Dominic, her stepson. However, when they confronted the man, he confessed his stupidity to his father. With a little research, it became obvious who had bought the painting, an Ilitsky from his abstract period, and even where it might be found. After approaching the new owner, who brazenly admitted he'd had the 
painting valued and considered himself the fortunate owner of a hundred thousand pound piece of art, and explaining the situation, he had promptly refused to return it, knowing there was no possibility Sinclair could do anything further about the matter. But surely, I said, if I steal it, he'll guess and just go to the police, who will contact my husband, who in turn will deny everything. After all, no theft was reported from this house, and the police will wonder if the picture even exists. But it will never get that far. I happen to know this individual has some past history with the police. He's unlikely to welcome the scrutiny of the authorities. But surely, I countered, he's sure to guess you're involved. Not at all. You see, it so happens he's going to be here at the weekend. He's a guest at my niece's wedding. Goodness, I replied. Isn't that all a little close to home? Well, yes, but while he's here, along with my useless husband and I, my indigent stepson and the beautiful bride and groom, you're going to be breaking into his cottage about twenty miles from here, giving you the perfect alibi. Yes, giving me the perfect alibi. You must be sure the alarm is triggered, fixing the time of your crime to match the wedding. Our crime, I put in. Our crime. So that the alibi holds, she said. I thought about it for a moment. It could work. We have to be sure we are not seen together in future, you understand? Yes, we should be careful, she agreed. And the second part of the punishment? Oh, yes, I nearly forgot. In the execution of this crime, I expect you to wear these. Mrs. Sinclair opened the little clutch bag by her side and drew out a pair of scarlet panties and placed them on the coffee table between us. But why? I said, flushing to a matching colour. Think of it as intruding on your privacy. Quid pro quo, you see. Quid pro quo, I repeated. 